The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Well, welcome everybody, and thanks for coming to the 22033 Nuclear Systems Design Project final presentation. My name is Mike Short. I've been the instructor for the course. I'm not going to say too much. I'm going to leave it to these guys. All I will tell you is at the beginning of the semester, um, I charged these folks with designing a reactor system that is capable of producing at least 100 megawatts electric and produces hydrogen and biofuels and sells at least one. And otherwise, the goal was to make the best design possible, to optimize it in terms of performance, safety, and cost. It's been a long, hard battle, but uh, I think the results have been quite fruitful. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Catherine and the rest of the 033 presenters to tell you what they've done. Hi, my name is Catherine, and I'm an integrator. I was charged with integrating um, our 22033 project along with Sarah. So we're going to give you a brief overview of our plan design before we get into specifics of the separate parts of our plan. Um, so uh, first I'll talk about why we chose this project. Um, there's a push towards green energy right now in the United States um, using clean energy to um, help our, with the climate change. and. Um, so our project will use um, low carbon emission, will have low carbon emissions for um, our biodiesel and biogasoline output. Currently, the United States um, has a very high dependence on foreign oil. So we're hoping with this um, reactor design, we can help displace um, some of that to more of a dependence on domestic oil. And our nuclear plant um, is gonna give us a high energy output um, and give us a lot of electricity to the grid um, compared to the maintenance cost. Um, and this is compared to um, like a coal plant, which has a higher maintenance costs and um, not so much of an electricity and energy output. So I'm Sarah. I'm, as Catherine mentioned earlier, I'm the other integrator for this project. Um, I know most of you aren't going to be able to read this. Um, we really just wanted to show you how complicated and vast our system is, um, but I'll talk you through it. So up here we have the reactor, which will interface with the process heat system, taking heat to a hydrogen heat exchanger, which then they use as steam for their system, which is over here. And it also takes heat to bio, the process heat system also takes heat to biofuels, which the heat is being deposited here. The hydrogen product is being taken along this path all the way up into their refining system. And here's the biofuel output, and it's taken to a truck and taken out to um, distributors. Um, this is the reactor design down here. Um, the core group will go into that more in more depth, and just some other intricate processes that are being used. Uh, we decided in order for ease of design, we separated the, group, the, we separated the system into four control volumes, uh, which is the reactor group over here, which was in charge of designing the reactor and the primary and secondary systems that correspond to that. The process heat group, which is in charge of taking heat to, from the core to the hydrogen and biofuels facilities, and also in charge of storing heat in order to um, keep the secondary system, uh, to, to keep the um, primary system um, online during shutdown. And, um, and then the biofuels facility, which is in charge of creating biofuels, and the hydrogen group, which is in charge of creating hydrogen. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Core. Uh, hello, my name is Bryn Enser. I was the focus area leader for the core group. Uh, the group consisted of myself, uh, Rory McDonald, uh, Robert Trenkon, and Jessica Hammond. And uh, I'm here to present to you the reactor that's going to be used in this whole, you know, 22033 project. Uh, just a brief overview of what I'll go through. Just talk about some goals, and then I'll go into the specific, specifics of the design, the fuel, 
some of the different things we did to analyze our core. Uh, our goal with designing this reactor is we wanted to be able to produce electricity, as Dr. Short mentioned, but we also wanted to be able to pr provide process heat for the uh, hydrogen and biofuels temperatures. And those processes required uh, a greater than your typical light water reactor temperature. So, we, so that challenged us to design something uh, new, something unique and innovative. Uh, and we think we were able to produce something similar to that. Finally, we wanted to be able to produce, some, produce something that was feasible in like, the near term future. We didn't want to design something that wasn't going to be able to get licensed. Uh, we considered a slew of different designs uh, from the get-go. Uh, some of them were eliminated right off the bat for different things, such as like the can-do didn't provide enough temperature for us. Uh, but these four reactors here were the ones that we really boiled it down to. Uh, we eliminated the sodium fast reactor uh, because it was very similar to our lead, cool, uh, lead bismuth eutectic fast reactor that we ended up choosing in the end. Um, but we thought that the, ex the extra little tidbit about the fact that sodium reacts violently with water uh, put it out of contention for us. Uh, the um, very high temperature reactor uh, was removed for consider from consideration because how big the plant was. And we wanted to try and keep a smaller footprint considering the size of our plant in general with biofuels and hydrogen production <coughs> on site as well. And finally, the molten salt reactor was removed because of the, uh, what we thought was a, a feasibility issue in the near term. The reason we chose the lead bismuth eutectic fast reactor was we were, we were thrilled with the high heat capacity of the coolant. Um, this, this reactor operated at atmospheric pressure, which is excellent for safety. Uh, it's got a very high power density. We can pack a lot of power into this core in a relatively small size. And also there's a lot of safety features that were pretty uh, beneficial to it too, including the fact that our plant can operate natural convection at full power. Um, a little interesting thing we decided to do is for our secondary loop, we chose supercritical CO2 uh, in a Brayton cycle. And part of the reason we chose this is because it has a, it's a high efficiency system. And the turbines that we're going to, that I'll show you, that we used were very small and were, were really cool. Uh, the final design puts out a, a 3575 megawatt thermal and can produce 1500 megawatt electric. Uh, we're, this power level is actually limited by the lead bismuth eutectic. Uh, itself. The, it, it's limited to about 2.5 <coughs> meters per second. Beyond that, you're going to see a lot of flow assisted corrosion, uh, so you have to limit it to that top, top speed. We will actually only be providing a gigawatt of electricity to the grid. The remaining 500 megawatts is going to remain on site for plant use. Uh, specifically, uh, the hydrogen will be using a lot of that. Here's a uh, radial and axial view of our core. Um, it's a pretty simple picture right here. It shows the core. Uh, it sits in a tank of lead bismuth eutectic, flows down, goes through our heat exchangers, comes back in. Uh, as you can see, we have three uh, shell and tube heat exchangers that we're going to be using, and our core is hexagon. What you can see better in the radial overview of the picture here. You can also see our, um, the ring design of our reactor. We have uh, 12 rings. Uh, the 12th ring is, is in red. Uh, we have the inner 10 rings consist of fuel and control rods. Uh, that we have uh, in black are the uh, uranium mononitride fuel regions. Uh, there is lead, lead bismuth flowing through there. I'll show you a picture in a second that uh, clearly differentiates the two. And the, there's 18 uh, purple boron carbide control rods right here. Uh, the 11th ring is a magnesium oxide reflector, and the 12th ring is a boron carbide shield material. And the, around the outside of our core is a uh, lead bismuth eutectic. This is a picture of one of our fuel assemblies. Um, we have 100 pins per fuel assembly. Um, they're in red. Uh, surrounding them is the lead bismuth eutectic uh, uh, flow that goes through our core. Our clad material, we're, right now we're using a, a two-layer T91 uh, with an outer protective uh, corrosion resistant layer. Uh, a thing, another thing we did in our core is we, do, we, we have different enrichments in different zones. The maximum enrichment we're using is about 15%, which we use in the uh, bottom outer six rings of our core. And the minimum enrichment we use is 10%, uh, which we use in the top middle 33% uh, of our core. The reason we did this was to flatten our flux profile and also to, uh, for the top 33%, we lowered the enrichment because we're using uh, rods to control our reactor. So that fuel is mostly going to be shielded during operation. This shows a, a couple of other uh, key operating parameters. Our outlet temperature is about 650 degrees C. Our inlet temperature is about 484. 
Um, we have a pretty high mass flow rate, about 143,600 kilograms per second. Uh, we do uh, use natural circulation to provide all that flow at full power. Um, we also have a pretty high linear heat rate, as you'll see here. Uh, this is just part of the fact that our core is like a pretty dense, densely packed core. And as mentioned before, we use uranium mononitride as our fuel material. The, I think uh, the picture, the, the, you should see, you'll see this line a little better, but the, this is the, uh, the criticality um, calculations. We used MCMP to code our reactor. Um, and it shows, it's right here, if you follow the cursor right there, is where the curve is. Uh, as the rods are withdrawn, um, the reactivity obviously goes up. We go critical about uh, 1.9 uh, meters out of, uh, from, from the bottom of our core. Uh, this big line right here is, shows the difference between the two uh, reactivity zones in our core. This picture right here is showing we did a thermal analysis of our fuel and our, and our different materials to make sure that our fuel was, um, would be so solid at full power operation. Uh, as you can see here, we, we, we approximated a linear heat rate with a, um, with a simple uh, sinusoidal shape. Uh, we set zero at the boundary conditions. In all reality, it's actually going to be flatter and pushed a little bit um, uh, up to the top of the core. Uh, but uh, the flatness of that re actual curve is actually going to end, means we're, we're using a little bit more of a conservative <coughs> model. Uh, we also only used a meter of active fuel height here. As I mentioned before, we're going to be going critical about 1.9 meters. Nevertheless, what we showed was that uh, at uh, about full power, the max uh, fuel, fuel temperature we're going to be having is about 8, 1,800 degrees C. And using uh, in further analysis, that extra conservatisms into it showed that like the most we could expect is about 1,950 degrees C. That's plenty of margin to the melting point uranium mononitride, which is 2,800. Um, one thing early on is we were actually using uranium dioxide as our fuel. And when we did that same thermal analysis, the results for the uranium dioxide fuel temperatures was uh, 6,600 degrees C. So that necess necessitated a switch to a different fuel material, which is why we chose uranium mononitride, because it has about a seven times better thermal conductivity than uranium dioxide. Uh, it has the same melting temperature, but it also actually is able to pack more uranium into the fuel itself, which allowed us to lower the enrichment of our core. Um, a little uh, tidbit about uranium mononitride is that you need to enrich the nitrogen to nitrogen-15, which is going to add fuel cost to our reactor. A big benefit of lead bismuth eutectic fast reactors is their ability to operate at natural convection. Um, we, we, we have shown that we are able to naturally convect at full power our reactor. We still need to do some analysis that shows whether or not during transient or shutdown situations if we are able to also provide full power. But what you can see here in this graph is uh, setting an outlet temperature about 650 degrees C. Uh, our inlet temperature is 484. We're the blue curve right here. And if you're above this line, this, ma this line which equates to a certain mass flux for our mass flow rate, you are in a natural convection, providing enough uh, natural convection flow. As you can see here, we are, in fact, providing enough flow for natural convection. Um, uh, as I mentioned, though, we need to we need to do a little bit more analysis to see those transient and shutdown situations. We also need to determine the benefits of a laminar versus a turbulent flow regime. Uh, one thing we were trying to get going was uh, to do a depletion of our car and see how long it lasted and get some kinematic values out. We were, we were using Aranos for this. We unfortunately were not able to do it uh, due to a couple of technical difficulties, but we are able to compare it to some other previous similar designs, including the LC Star and the 2400 megawatt thermal MIT reactor. Uh, most similar to our reactor was the, was the MIT reactor, and that achieved an 1,800-day lifetime uh, with a core beginning, uh, K effective at the beginning of life of 1.02. Uh, we have double the excess reactivity of that core, so, but we also operate at a higher power level. So we expect to, that we'll probably see some increase in lifetime from that number. Uh, this table right here shows the, uh, how our plutonium, uranium, and minor actinide uh, <coughs> masses change over time. Uh, we are breeder reactors, so we do breed plutonium, but we also burn a significant amount of minor actinides, which is going to be useful for waste storage and uh, costs. Again, what we were hoping to get out was some kinematic values from our code, and we haven't been able to get that up and running yet. But again, we can show you some similar situations. Uh, we expect our Doppler coefficient to be negative. Um, it was for the MIT reactor. We, we think our actually will be slightly less negative. 
Um, we also expect our temperature coefficient to be positive, um, although we think uh, because we're using a magnesium oxide reflector, there's been some research on there that that can bring down the temperature coefficient. So we're hoping for a similar result in our reactor. Uh, but again, we need to do a lot more um, calculations on these to actually get it running and see for sure what the numbers are. Uh, just a brief overview of what we're giving. We're giving gigawatt to the, to the grid, uh, about half a gigawatt for, our own, for keeping on, on site, and we're, we're providing about 315 megawatt thermal to a process heat uh, for those uh, biofuels and hydrogen production. And how we do this is we have a secondary loop, as I mentioned, of supercritical CO2. Uh, the efficiency of our system, including the fact that we're removing heat um, from, to process heat, is about 42.2%. Uh, we have three loops. As I mentioned, we have three heat exchangers. In each loop, there's two turbines uh, rated at about 250 megawatts each, uh, and uh, a number of different other reheaters, compressors, and components there um, in our secondary system. Uh, we designed the secondary system in EAST, uh, which, was, which was an excellent tool for optimization. It calculated temperatures and mass flows for us. It had all the enthalpy values for supercritical CO2. It made the process uh, very streamlined. Um, I think the reason we added that second turbine is we didn't want to have six loops. Um, and so we, we decided to have two turbines in, one, in, in three loops as opposed to six turbines in each their own loop. Uh, the energy divider to process heat uh, does not significantly affect our, our efficiency of our secondary cycle, but had we not been diverting that um, process heat, we, our efficiency would be about 45.8%. Uh, the reason we use the shell and tube heat exchangers is because we, we were actually comparing it to the printed circuit heat exchangers, and you'll, you'll hear more about this from the pro process heat folks. Um, and the reason we couldn't go with printed circuit heat exchangers is because of the friction factors that the LBE introduced. So that removed the printed circuit heat exchangers from contention, and we went with um, uh, some shell and tube heat exchangers. Uh, one of the huge benefits of our reactor is actually the size of our turbines. Um, the size of our turbines is um, at a first order estimate is about the size of this table right in front of me. Um, as you can see here, compared to a steam helium uh, turbine, this is our little guy, and this is the size of those turbines. Uh, also of note is the fact that this turbine right here produces more energy than either of these two turbines. So this was really great. Like I said, we're trying to keep our footprint pretty small, and our reactor, um, compared to like the rest of the plant, actually has a fairly small footprint. There are some stuff left to do, though. Um, the, clad, the T91 clad material that we're using right now uh, can't really go any, any higher in temperature. At about 700 degrees C, there's going to be a lot, there's going to be significant creep effects. And right now, our, our, our lifetime is, our clad lifetime is limited to about a year and a quarter uh, because of those creep effects. So we're looking to switch to a different, um, different clad material, probably some like oxide dispersed steels or something. Uh, there's another, uh, there's a couple other things we're looking at is uh, efficiency improvements in the secondary systems. We still think we can uh, make it a better, uh, more efficient system. And we want to look at different uh, alternate fuel materials to get rid of that need to enrich that nitrogen for our uranium mononitrite. So we're going to be looking at uh, seeing how uranium carbide performs as well. And as I mentioned a couple times, we're going to try and get that full depletion and kinematic analysis done to really get those numbers out and see how long our core, li li uh, our core lasts. And finally, we're gonna, we're gonna, we have to finish our natural con, uh, circulation calculations to see how it acts during transient and shutdown situations. But um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to the process heat folks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Aditi, and this is Lauren. We're going to be presenting on behalf of the process heat team. We're going to begin with our goals. I'm going to discuss our heat exchangers, and Lauren is going to talk about the piping, the heat storage, and also discuss our future work. So the main goals of the process heat team were to draw heat from the core to provide steam to the hydrogen and biofuels plants. Our other goal, main goal also was to keep the lead bismuth eutectic melted during reactor shutdown. And we needed to design this system for operation both at high temperatures and high pressures. This is our system layout. We begin with a heat exchange with the supercritical CO2 loop. That takes place in nine printed circuit heat exchanger <coughs> units connected in parallel. 
the helium, which is our working fluid, gets heated up to 606.5 Celsius and goes to the heat storage. Some of it is rerouted around it. The two streams combine and then go to the 12 printed circuit heat exchanger units connected in parallel, which are at the hydrogen plant. The colder helium goes back to the printed circuit heat exchanger units at the supercritical CO2 loop. We also have an emergency sink here to remove the heat from our system in the event of a reactor scram. And there is a separate heat exchanger here which is not on our main loop, which will draw heat from the steam, hydrogen, and oxygen streams at the hydrogen plant to produce stream, uh, steam for the biofuels at 0.1 megapascals and 182 Celsius. So this is an overview of our pressure changes and temperature changes in our system. As you can see, the pressure drops are fairly small for the heat exchangers. They're the order of kilopascals. The largest pressure drop in our system is at the heat storage, which is 1,000 kilopascals, which is why we have a circulator right after the storage. Our heat storage device was also designed to have a temp temperature drop of just minus 1.5. Celsius, and the pressure drop for the piping, for 30 meters of the piping, is 2.047 kilopascals, and the temperature drop is 0.041 Celsius. So, well, I'm going to discuss our design choices for the heat exchangers now. We chose printed circuit heat exchangers ma mainly because of their high allowable operating temperatures and pressures, and also their small volumes and high effectivenesses. Other options were fuse plate heat exchangers, and the shell and tube ones are down here. Obviously, you can see they were operating at about 630 and 20 megapascals, and so we would have been right on the boundary for the fuse plate heat exchangers. So this is why we went for the printed circuit heat exchangers. These heat exchangers are actually really interesting. They're fabricated by etching the fluid flow passages chemically on metal plates, and these metal plates are then diffusion bonded together. The next thing to do was to choose a working fluid for our system. We considered carbon dioxide, water, and helium because of previous operational experience with printed circuit heat exchangers. In the end, we chose helium because of its high heat capacity, which meant lower mass flow rates, and lower viscosity, which meant lower frictional losses. We chose alloy 617 for actually fabricating the printed circuit heat exchangers because of its high thermal co conductivity and also because of its high design stress at temperatures in the ranges that we were interested in. And so the point here is that the printed circuit heat exchangers will operate well below the design stresses for alloy 617 at all points in our system. We haven't actually shown the stresses in our heat exchangers here. We calculated them using the thick cylinder approximation, found them to be about 20 megapascals. Once we um, add in the correction factors for the sharp edges of the so semicircular flow channels, we expect that they'll be closer to about 100 megapascals. And so this is an overview of the printed circuit heat exchangers. I will talk about the heat exchanger at the hydrogen plant separately a little later. So the first one is nine units of 35 megawatt printed circuit heat exchangers connected in parallel. And the one at the hydrogen plant is 12 units of the 26 megawatt printed circuit heat exchangers also connected in parallel. You see there's a difference in the total heat rate here, and that's what we expected our transmission losses to be. We chose a zigzag channel configuration for PCHE1 and a straight channel one for PCHE2. This is because we have water in this heat exchanger, and we didn't want our frictional losses to be high. Other than that, you can see that the total heat transfer coefficient for the straight channel printed circuit heat exchanger is much smaller. This is because the zigzag channels make the flow turbulent. This improves heat transfer and reduces the heat exchanger volume. And so we are losing out a little bit of that advantage here with the straight channel. But these heat exchangers are still significantly smaller than the shell and tube designs. So now these are the um, temperature and heat flux profiles of the printed circuit heat exchangers. This is for PCHE1. The heat exchanger has a zigzag uh, 
has zigzag flow channels and a counter flow configuration. The heat transfer is by single phase forced convection. You can see there are no abrupt swings in temperature or heat flux. The CO2 is turbulent and the helium is laminar. The flow directions are listed here. The CO2 comes in from there and flows to the right, and the helium begins here and flows in the other direction, so it's counter flow. This is the second printed heat exchanger, which should have been labeled as PCHE2, but anyway. This heat exchanger has straight channels, and again, a counter flow configuration. The flow directions are here again. We have a two-phase flow region in this heat exchanger, and this was modeled using a Fortran code, which was actually written at MIT. And we found unphysical behavior in this region to the right of 0.68 meters, where the fluids were just sitting there, and there really was no heat transfer. So excluding this region has no impact on our inlet or outlet temperature. So we're going to exclude this and say that our actual heat exchanger is everything to the left of this line. And in this heat exchanger, both fluids are laminar. Unfortunately, there are large swings in temperature and heat flux. And so future work should address designing this heat exchanger as three separate heat exchangers, a high temperature region, a two phase region, and the lower temperature single phase region, just so that we can avoid the large thermal stresses and alloy 6117. And, um, also to have a larger design life for the lower temperature sections. We also looked into fouling and design life issues. Studies showed that PCHEs can operate for up to 500 to 660 hours without any change in effectiveness, but with a 55% increase in pressure drop. We don't have an exact number for, for what the fuel cycle length is going to be, but anything of the order of 18 months is 12,960 hours. So the way to counter this 55% increase in pressure drop, which is probably going to be greater than that, if you're going to operate these printed circuit heat exchangers continuously for 12,960 hours, is to either install redundant units, and we think this is our best option, or to add chlorine at least to the water stream that's going to go in to reduce biofouling. The problem with doing this, the addition of chlorine, is that it will then have to be separated from the steam before it goes to the hydrogen plant for high temperature steam electrolysis. And finally, the biofuels heat exchanger, which hasn't been designed and again is the subject of future work. We want to recover the heat from the <coughs> steam, hydrogen, and oxygen that is going to come out at the hydrogen plant to produce steam for the biofuels plant. That steam will be produced at 182 Celsius and 0.1 megapascals. The problem here is that we have highly oxidative and reductive environments in the same heat exchanger. So really, the only materials that we can use are ceramics. Respective materials for fabricating this heat exchanger are reaction bonded silicon carbide or siliconized <coughs> silicon carbide. Both of these materials have significantly lower thermal conductivities compared to alloy 617 but they can operate at high temperatures and they can withstand highly oxidative and reductive environments. And Lauren will now talk about mm -hmm. piping, heat storage, and control. So this is the piping scheme we're gonna go with uh, for transporting the helium throughout our system. Uh, this insulation will allow us to have minimal temperature losses as it transfers from facility to facility. We're gonna have our inner diameter of two meters for helium, and if you remember from our system outline, this is going to be at about five megapascals. Um, so in order to deal with that stress, we're gonna have a 50 millimeter uh, layer right here of alloy 625 flow liner, and that's actually also going to minimize our frictional losses uh, to on the order of kilopascals over the course of 30 meters. Um, after the flow liner, we're gonna have a one millimeter layer of aerogel insulation and then a 50 millimeter layer of alloy uh, 304 stainless steel, and then a one millimeter layer of Gemcolite 2600, which is a ceramic insulator. And that's gonna minimize our temperature losses to on the order of 100th of a degree Celsius over the course of 30 meters, which is the longest distance it needs to travel in our plant. Um, so regarding heat storage, we decided to store heat in order to keep the lead bismuth of the reactor's primary loop molten uh, during shutdown. 
after the decay heat uh, is low enough that it can't do so on its own. So in order to do so, we decided to go with a latent heat thermal energy storage uh, system, which is storing energy in the latent heat of a uh, phase change rather than storing energy in the sensible heat of changing the temperature of a material. Um, it's more efficient since it's got a higher energy density and it also releases heat over a constant temperature as opposed to cooling down as it discharges. Uh, so in order to do so, we had to pick a phase change material, which is what PCM stands for. And we went with lithium chloride to store the energy because, as you can see, its melting point is 605 degrees Celsius, which is right at the operating temperature of our system, 606.5 degrees Celsius <laughs> as it comes out of that first heat exchanger. Um, so this means we can neglect any sensible heat that it's storing after the phase change from solid to liquid. Um, as you can see, latent heat of fusion is several orders of magnitude higher than the specific heat of the material, so it's much more efficient to store it as latent heat. Um, and then because it's a molten salt, it's a good conductor of electricity, um, we wanted to make sure to avoid any corrosion <coughs> issues, so we chose the containment material to be alloy 20, which is a nickel chromium molybdenum alloy, and it's extremely resistant to chloride ion corrosion, so it's got excellent compatibility with lithium chloride. Melting points also well above the uh, operating temperature of our system, so we don't expect to have materials issues there. It's also got a pretty high thermal conductivity, which means, uh, which is good because we have to conduct heat through it. This is just a quick overview of the heat exchanger we're going to use for the storage device. We can't use a traditional heat exchanger since uh, when the lithium chloride is a solid, we obviously can't pump it through our system. So instead, the lithium chloride is going to be stored in these slabs here. These are long and they're going to be flat go into the page a lot, um, <laughs> and they're going to be contained with alloy 20. Um, the helium is going to flow through these gaps in between the slabs, and uh, depending on whether we're discharging or storing or in steady state, uh, these valves are going to be open. I'll go over those layouts in a few minutes. Um, this is just another view of the heat exchanger. This is now the helium flowing into the page. These are the dimensions of the uh, device. They're going to be 10 slabs of lithium chloride. And the device itself is actually going to be 20 meters long, so it's going to take up most of the space in between the uh, heat exchanger with the core secondary loop and the heat exchanger with the hydrogen plant. Um, these dimensions were chosen to uh, make the Reynolds number of the helium turbulent in order for better heat transfer properties, and also to store enough lithium chloride to keep the lead bismuth melted for two weeks. Uh, that results in about 4,000 meters cubed of lithium chloride, so it's a pretty big tank. This is going to be the layout during charging. It's pretty similar to our, uh, our st steady state layout, except here is where it would normally go off to the hydrogen plant and exchange, uh, go through the hydrogen PCHEs. That's going to be valved off because uh, while we're not in steady state, this outlet temperature isn't going to be constant. Uh, so we're going to wait to add the hydrogen plant onto our system until storage is completely charged. And also, the only other thing that's different is we're going to have a 67 megawatt preheater right here. That's going to heat the, uh, the helium going into the lithium chloride storage to 705 degrees Celsius uh, because of the, the temperature of the helium going into storage is only a degree and a half above the melting point. It's actually going to take on the order of years or ten of, tens of years to completely charge the storage and that's not really feasible. So <laughs> with this 67 megawatt preheater, we can reduce the charging time down to 33 days and 12 hours, which is a lot more realistic. Then the discharging layout, um, we're going to shut off our main loop. Uh, storage isn't going to be taking any more heat from the core at this point. And instead, we're going to cycle helium through this <laughs> loop here uh, mm -hmm. to a shell and tube heat exchanger with the, primary, the core's primary loop. Um, we're staying with helium so we don't contaminate the storage device with any lead bismuth. And uh, because the heat rate of the storage device is actually going to depend on the distance between the phase front within the lithium chloride and the edge of the slab, it's obviously going to depend on time as that lithium chloride releases its energy and solidifies. So um, this inlet temperature is really important because if it's too low, uh, too much energy is going to be drawn out too soon and you're going to use up all the energy before two weeks are up. And if it's too high, then you're still going to have energy left over after two weeks. Um, so this inlet temperature of 550 optimizes that and it draws out all the energy over the course of two weeks. But because that means that this, temp this uh, power rate is changing, this power is going to have to equal this one. Uh, in order to do that, we're going to vary the mass flow rate of the lead bismuth throughout the primary loop. 
So this MC delta T for this heat exchanger is equal to this one, and we have an energy balance. Um, so this mass flow right here is going to vary such that that's the case. We also have a few emergency situations, just in case something goes wrong. Um, for example, with the storage, if any of the lithium chloride were to leak out of a slab, uh, it would be pretty bad for a loop because none of our other materials are necessarily compatible with lithium chloride other than the alloy 20. And also, any time the temperature drops below 605 degrees, it's going to solidify, clog our pipes, clog our PCHEs, uh, which we really don't want to deal with. So in the event of a leak, we're going to actually reroute all the helium flow around both the storage device and the compressor, since by doing that, we'll remove that large pressure drop and uh, just completely valve off that storage. And we also have a heat sink uh, in case of a loss of load. If we lose either of our biofuels or hydrogen facilities, the reactor is actually going to shut down as well. Um, but we're still going to have to deal with the decay heat. And the average decay heat coming from the core to process heat, which is not the total decay heat, um, an hour after shutdown is going to be about 5 megawatts. So in order to deal with this, we're going to have a heat exchanger uh, with our environmental body of water. Uh, due to EPA limits, the maximum temperature change we can uh, put into the water is 10 degrees Celsius. So we're going to use a volumetric flow rate of 455 gallons a second using a titanium plate type heat exchanger, which is specifically for marine applications. And it's actually also going to have diffusers at the outlets such that the, uh, the water coming out at a higher temperature diffuses more quickly and doesn't shock the water. So for future work, we're going to have to compare the PCHEs at both the core <laughs> and the hydrogen plant uh, with shell and tube type designs to see if those might be more appropriate for our system, as well as Aditi mentioned splitting that hydrogen PCHE into multiple stages. We also have to take a look at PCHE fouling factors and correlation factors for determining the critical heat flux values for semicircular channels in those PCHEs. Uh, we have to determine that mass flow rate function of the lead bismuth so it can be matched properly to the storage discharge rate. And also ensure that a delta T of 10 degrees is actually enough to keep that uh, lead bismuth mo molten for even the lowest value of mass flow rate so that the transmission losses versus the still incoming decay heat uh, isn't causing it to freeze as it goes through the system. Um, we also have to see the effects of a support system on those lithium chloride slabs since they're really large slabs. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to make sure that a support system isn't going to mess with the helium flow in unexpected ways and also take a look at the insulation for both steady state and shutdown. It's going to have to be insulated such that the, uh, the temperature doesn't drop below 605 degrees Celsius. We're probably going to use the same insulation scheme as we are for piping. So that, turn it over to hydrogen. Hello, everyone. I'm Derek Sutherland. I will be a representative of the hydrogen production plant, along with Ben, Rebecca, and Lauren. So first, I want to give a general outline of the presentation I'll be giving. Uh, first, we're going to consider the engineering objectives that motivated our design choices and also go into the options for hydrogen production that we had in the first place. First, so our primary decision was the UT3 process was named after University of Tokyo where it was discovered. Um, but due to a change in inputs midway through the semester, we had to switch to a different process called high temperature steam electrolysis. And then we will go into the future work that we propose. So first, the hydrogen production plant had to decide what our purpose was going to be. Um, we were either going to supply hydrogen for a hydrogen fuel cell economy, or we were just going to make enough hydrogen for the biofuels plant to utilize for making biodiesel and biogasoline. Uh, after researching the problems with the distribution um, of hydrogen and the current infrastructure in this country, we felt it was a better idea to just supply the hydrogen for the biofuels plant exclusively. Um, so with that as the underlying motivation for our entire purpose in this project, we sought to maximize the use of process heat because heat, after all, is more efficient to use than electricity because whenever we use electricity, we have to take a thermodynamic hit uh, just from second law of thermodynamics. So we wanted to maximize the process heat. Uh, completely symmetric, we want to minimize electricity use just for that reason. And also, since our whole objective is for green energy, we want it to have zero net greenhouse emissions. Okay, so these are the main uh, choices we have for hydrogen production processes. The acronyms are defined below for your convenience. 
Um, the main the two that came down, the, 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 the top two that we had to decide between was the UT3 process down here and the high temperature steam electrolysis process. These other processes, primarily the sodium iodide, which was, I guess, the third runner-up, was discounted because of the high operating temperature and also due to the highly, um, the, the large material concerns that we had to deal with when dealing with sulfuric acid and what have you. And so we then chose the UT3 process because it occurs at a slightly lower temperature, 760 compared to 850, but it was also has been proven to be commercially viable through multiple studies in Japan. And so this is the process we decided to go with. Like I said, we ended up having to switch to high temperature steam electrolysis partway through the semester, and that was our second choice, but I'll talk more about that when I get to that. Okay, so first I wanted to give a general overview of the UT3 process. Um, so basically it is a four-step reaction, or four reaction process. Each reaction occurs in a separate reactor. We have two calcium reactor units, which are basically named after the primary reactants being calcium molecules, and then two iron reactor units. Um, this process is interesting in that you connect these four, you connect these four um, reactors in series, and the reactions are such that the reactants of one reaction become the products of the other and vice versa. As you can see here, this reaction precedes the calcium oxide and hydrobromic acid, and down here the reactant is calcium oxide. And so basically the idea overall of this process is to flow, have a working fluid of steam in excess to basically push the reactants around. And you push everything to completion in one direction, then you basically use a compressor to switch the flow and then proceed in the other direction. And this just swinging, this cyclic operation enables a constant hydrogen output. Um, the main problem we had to deal with materials wise I mean, it's not quite as bad as the sulfur iodine process, but we did have to do with hydrobromic acid and bromine, which, of course, we uh, looked into special piping like um, that we could withstand that type of acidity. But also, I guess more fundamentally, was the calcium oxide system becoming brominated and turning into calcium bromide. So calcium oxide and calcium bromide have a 76% volumetric change during bromination. And so you have to design a structure, a calcium pellet structure, that, a, that can withstand that structural stress. And so we basically looked into um, uh, calcium pellet structures that are able to withstand that, and we were able to overcome that problem. So like I said, so that's an overview of the UT3 process. And we had a problem midway through the semester and that the necessary steam temperatures we required, which is 760, the highest temperature of the UT3 process, uh, was not able to be supplied, and we were looking at something more like 560 as our maximum operating temperature. Um, so at first, first response is to electrically heat it the rest of the way to 760, but the problem with the UT3 process is you use a lot of excess steam to be the main working fluid of the system. And so the ratio of the actual reacting steam to the excess steam is something like 1 to 1,000. And so the actual power required to heat up the steam from 560 up to 760 would have been something like 1,600 megawatts. And since uh, the core isn't putting out 1,600 megawatts, we don't want to use all of the electricity. So we didn't see that as feasible. Also, we decided later to scale up for the biofuel production plant. And so if we scaled up even further, it would turn something into like 3,000 megawatt electric, which is just a little bit ridiculous. And so basically, we decided that we needed a new hydrogen production process. And so now I'm going to go into high temperature steam electrolysis. So this is just a uh, cartoon of actually how it works, mm -hmm. simply. First, we have a porous cathode and a porous anode, which allows steam, hydrogen, and oxygen to be transported through the, um, the potential, or the, yeah, the, the sides of it. And so the steam comes in, it permeates into this porous cathode, and it's split on the surface of this gas tight electrolyte, which is shown with the oxygen ions being transported across it. So I'm going to show it a little bit more rigorously. So the steam comes in, and on the surface of it, this is where the hydrogen is, or the water is split into its constituents. And so we have a porous cathode, porous anode, and an electrolyte that is gas tight to prevent recombination of hydrogen and oxygen. Um, critical, parameter, or critical properties of the electrolyte that we require is that it's dense. Basically, we want to uh, maximize the conductivity, which doesn't necessarily fall from density, but it does. It is related. 
but more importantly, we'll want a high ionic conductivity and coupled with it being thin to reduce the ohmic resistance overall. And so that'll also equate to a, more, a higher electrical efficiency, I guess you could say. Um, like I said, it has to be gas type because we don't want H and O to recombine because we're trying to split them after all. And more, I guess, less important than that is the electrode properties, but you, it does have to be porous, but we have a little bit more leeway into what we can use for the cathode and anode compared to the electrolytes. Um, we also want the electrodes to be of similar thermal expansion coefficient to the electrolyte because we don't want during startup when we're heating up these electrodes to 800 degrees C, which is basically what we're operating at, we don't want the whole system to buckle. And so we had a couple decisions between the um, electrolyte material. And so all of these, so the, I should have put a key at the bottom, but this is like galenium dope cerium based oxides, uh, I guess sulfur dope cesium, and then barium cesium oxide, I mean, and, but basically it came down to these two at the top because of their high ionic conductivity and close to the operational temperature. So this is the uh, optimal temperature, which equates to 1,000 C, but I just said we're operating at 800. But even though it's not optimal, the conductivity of these uh, at 800 C is sufficient for our purposes. And so we came down to these two, yttrium stabilized zirconia and scandium stabilized zirconia. And scandium stabilized zirconia is very, very expensive compared to yttrium st stabilized zirconia. And so we decided to go with YSZ as our primary electrolyte material. Okay, so the rest of this project, the rest of this design project, I felt like the best way to explain it is to actually go through the system as the steam flows and just explain our design considerations, the questions we had, and how everything worked together in this entire system. So conceptually looking at this, I guess you can think of it as we have a primary system going vertically down, and then we have two secondary systems on the outside, which, I, which we coined as the term regenerative heating. And so I'm gonna start with the primary system that we all designed. So first, this is our main put input of the system. We receive steam from process heat at 559 degrees C and at slightly above atmospheric pressure. We have a mass flow rate of 88 kilograms per second of steam, which like I said, um, UT3 process, it actually turns out to be something like 675 kilograms per second. So even though we have a low temperature, we're gonna to have to heat it up to 800, the electrical requirement, which I put it here, the startup electrical requirement, is only 120 megawatts compared to something massive like 3,000 megawatts. So even though we still have the same problem of having too cold of steam, we're able to get past that with this regenerative heating and we're saved by the fact that the mass flow rate required for this process is not as high. And so the steam comes in, and as I said, we have to heat it up. So the system is going to have a two-stage operational, um, I guess, situation. One, we're going to have our startup situation where we're going to have to raise the temperature electrically. And so the actual energy required to raise the steam is 48 megawatts, but assuming a 40% efficiency for our electric heaters, it's more like 120 megawatts. This electrical requirement is the electrical requirement we're seeking to reduce with this regenerative heating cycle, which I'll get to in a second. So once we raise this up to 800 degrees, which is sufficient for our SOEC, or solid oxide electrolyzer cells, to operate at, we then split it into a massive parallel structure. So I only put three up here just to drive the point home, but we're actually going to have thousands of these in parallel. And these SOECs are actually stacks, roughly 60 layers tall of these planar uh, materials, electrolyte, uh, electrolyte materials. And, they're all, and these stacks are all connected in parallel. So even though there's just three, they're just keeping your head, it's going to be thousands. And the actual surface area we require for this is 40 football fields. It sounds like a lot. But since you're able to stack these 60 high, you're actually able to reduce the footprint of this to something like less than a football field, which is great. And so the key in this whole system, and to have this regenerative heating to be possible, is that you have to operate these SOECs at a certain amperage in order to heat up the products as they propagate through. So when the steam comes in, it's at 800 degrees. But once it's split, if you're operating at 7,000 amps per meter squared, it actually heats it up by 40 degrees Celsius. 
and we basically have outlet temperatures of the oxygen and, hydrogen, or, and the H2O, H2 mixture higher than our inlet, so it introduces the capability of cooling down the products and cycling it out to the inlet. Um, these SOEC cells are fairly efficient. We're able to conceivably get an 80% conversion of the steam coming in to hydrogen and the rest product steam coming out. Then the oxygen is split off. Okay, so just for um, scale, our mass flow rate of O2 is 62.6 kilograms per second, which is a lot of oxygen. And we're basically going to cool that stream down to 71C from 840, and that's going to be part of our regenerative heating cycle. And what we're going to do with the, hydro or the oxygen, we're not completely sure yet. We could sell it, but we have a lot if anyone wants it. And so now you have a H2O, H2 mixture, which is actually the mixture we're interested in since we want to separate out the hydrogen. So this is also at 840 degrees C. It comes into this heat exchanger system, is cooled to 71 exiting, and then the fall, and it's cooled back down to room temperature at 75 with a condenser. And this is where the actual hydrogen is split off because you can condense water, but good, looking, good luck at condensing hydrogen at 25 degrees C. And so the rest of the H2O is discharged at room temperature, which the EPA has no problem with. And so the main regenerative heating, pro I mean, the regenerative heating system is consolidated in, eight, in heat exchanger two and three. And so basically the idea is that we have these liquid streams of water slightly above room temperature at 35 degrees C. They come in and they, are, they interface with our exiting streams. And we're actually able to extract 60, or roughly 70 megawatts of power from the stream. And the stream exiting will actually be at a temperature at 80, 800 degrees. And so, of course, we're not able to heat the exiting stream up in heat exchanger one to exactly 800 because that would require a very large heat exchanger. So we still will need some steady state power to raise it up that extra 20 degrees from 780 to 800. But essentially, we're reducing our startup power requirement once this regeneration cycle begins from 120 megawatts to something like 15 megawatts. And so I think it's definitely worth our while to offset our electrical power uh, using the system. Of course, since this is electrolysis, we also need a steady state to ma maintain the potentials as the currents start flowing through the electrodes. And so we need a steady state power, which, uh, which we estimated to 390 to 410 megawatts. Um, this is one of the values that, I would like, that we would like to simulate later and to get a more definitive number, but this is the best estimation that we found. Um, the, the most interesting thing about this regenerative heating cycle is that we saw that not, we can't extract, we need 47.9 megawatts total to heat up everything to 800, and we need even less to heat up to 780. But we, I said we have 70 megawatts left. We, we can extract 70 megawatts from these two streams. And so we saw this as an opportunity to ship our excess power back to biofuels so they can utilize it to raise, to basically preheat their system and supply, I think, or sorry, ship it back to process heat there so they can supply steam to biofuels at 182C, I think it was. And so we're basically squeezing as much power as we can out of the system and increasing our overall efficiency um, to the utmost degree. And overall, that is the, our entire system. And so I'm going to and with our future work, so like I said, our main goal is going to be to determine the electrical requirement a little bit more precisely using a simulation software or um, any other means that we can find. And, and also, I wanted to add a third bullet point, but we also want to look into emergency situations. Hydrogen leaks are normally not a good thing. Um, so we need to look into those, what we're going to do under accident scenarios and also what we're going to do in the case of loss of load, the biofuels plant doesn't need our hydrogen. And so with that, I'd like to pass it on to the biofuels production plant. Mr. Salazar. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alex Salazar. Um, I, along with uh, Lizzie Wayne, will talk about implementing biofuels production into our uh, nuclear reactor complex. Um, so first, I'm going to uh, delineate our general purpose behind uh, introducing biofuels into our process, um, give you an overview of our overall design, and uh, 
our choice of feedstock, our choice of biomass that we're going to be using to make our biofuels. Um, we will then go through each of our individual sub-processes uh, that will lead to a, a crude product that we could distill and refine into an end product that can be used by consumers. Um, then we'll also, like Derek just did, give some uh, thoughts and future that we can do uh, to improve our process. Um, so as Derek mentioned, uh, we found that it was more optimal to, instead of reduce both hydrogen and biofuels, to just use the output from the hydrogen reactor into, uh, into our biofuels process. Um, so basically, after they redesigned their system into producing uh, 7.9 kilograms per second of hydrogen, we were able to get our um, scale up from that and decide how much um, biomass we're going to put into our system. Um, and apart from using just hydrogen, we're also using process heat and electricity from the reactor. Um, this is a large-scale operation. Uh, it's going to compete somewhat with the other fossil-based oil refineries in the region. And um, what really makes this unique is that we're coupling, uh, you know, green sustainable energy with uh, nuclear reactors, which are, you know, emissions-free green technology. So um, we hope that will appeal to the public, uh, the public eye in, in a very uh, positive way. So um, here's an overview of our process. Um, you can see right here, we start out with Mother Nature. Uh, that is a picture of uh, switchgrass, uh, Panica vergatum. Uh, grow it all over the United States. Uh, I'm going to talk more about that a little bit later, why we chose this particular plant. Um, basically, we had to take this uh, switchgrass, process it, in a way that it could be injected into a gasifier where we get uh, air heated from the atmosphere um, and steam from our heat process um, in such a way that we get something as syngas. Um, this syngas is uh, going to um, have some certain uh, poisons that aren't going to be uh, uh, beneficial for subsequent processes, so those, it has to be cleaned, and so we're going to use the acid gas removal process. Um, once it's cleaned, uh, we put it through a fischer trope reactor, which produces a sort of a crude oil, sort of, um, that we could put through a distillation and refining process um, that'll give our end product. Um, here is a graph of relating different types of feedstock that we could use. And um, <laughs> basically, uh, switchgrass up here in the upper left it costs a bit more than some other alternatives, sorghum, energy cane, sugar cane, corn, and even some uh, non-plant sources like algae. Um, however, if you look at this column, uh, the energy density is much more, it's considerably higher than the other ones, and um, it's much more economic actually for us to get uh, work with a plant that has a greater lignocellulosic uh, concentration um, to get more bang for our buck per se. Um, uh, it's in the ligno, lignin and the cellulose and the plants that really uh, that allow us to get the uh, the things that will the precursors to uh, bio biogasoline and biodiesel. Um, so trash is pretty good because it doesn't compete with the other. Uh, it's not a food crop. You know, the, if we inject switchgrass into our reactor, we're not stealing food from families. We're not taking food off plates. Um, also, it's just very easy to grow as a C4 fixation cycle, so it could grow. Um, it's much more efficient at you know using water and uh, other uh, fertilizers, uh, and um, and it pretty much grows like a weed. So uh, that's why we chose switchgrass compared to these other alternatives. Um, here's a map of the United States showing uh, different uh, yields for switchgrass. Um, as you can see, there's a high concentration in the uh, Texas, Louisiana area, Florida, and somewhere in the Carolinas, Virginia. Um, we decided to choose uh, Texas uh, due to its um, uh, proximity to, a, uh, to other switchgrass growing locations and to a natural body of water. Um, specifically, we chose uh, Harris County, Texas as our site. Um, as you can see from this map, uh, Harris County has a very high yield of uh, biomass that can be grown in the region. And um, even if we don't get our biomass from the region, uh, existing railroad and um, ground networks will allow us to get biomass from uh, nearby growers. Um, uh, hydrogen and 
a couple of the other people were explaining like, oh, we're getting, we're using the natural reservoir for our water. Um, uh, we have Trinity Bay right here. And then for some of our larger water-based processes, uh, our coin processes, we could, you know, use the Gulf of Mexico. Um, in terms of where we're going to obtain uh, switchgrass, um, there's a ton of uh, local growers around there. Um, so we, it was much more economical and for, uh, instead of us to grow it ourselves, to outsource it. So basically to, um, you know, uh, hire, hire out the job to the farmers themselves. And uh, there's there are a ton of grain elevators around Texas. Um, I, there's a bunch of uh, co-ops that'll be willing to um, both sell, I mean, to both grow the product and to process it for us. And what I mean by processing is that uh, switchgrass has a certain density, like right out of the ground, it's like 100 kilograms per meter cubed. But that's not very practical to transport. So what's necessary to do beforehand is to pelletize it, to make it into a denser product. That way it's you know, much more easier to inject into an industrial process and it's much more uh, efficient to transport. And uh, based upon hydrogen's upper limit of uh, product, 7.9 kilograms per second, we were actually able to figure out that, oh, we could make, uh, we, we'd have to inject about 24 kilograms per second into our uh, gasifier in order to, uh, you know, prop to, use all of that hydrogen fully. And that amounts to about 2,903 tons a day. Um, so in terms of transporting that, we wanted to find growing locations that were uh, less than 200 kilometers, because after that there's trade-offs that we don't ex uh, expect, I mean, that we do not want. Um, so that would amount to about 85 flatbed grain trucks traveling along uh, Texas Highway 6. Um, a more practical thing to do would be to use uh, railroad uh, uh, the railroad networks um, using uh, hopper cars, and that would only be about 13. And e even when that full capacity is pretty good because they're nowhere near nowhere near straining the load limits on the cars. So um, also there's just like tons of railroads around Harris County, so we could just hop uh, easily latch onto those uh, existing systems. Um, in terms of storage, uh, you know, we're going to use the grain elevators. Um, I remember seeing, uh, looking up one grain elevator that was pretty much able to hold 265 operating days worth of switchgrass, I mean, of, of grain. So um, it, it's just more economic to outsource storage to uh, the holders of these grain elevators. However, we are going to have one on site. Um, just to have a safe buffer for operation, it'll hold about three days worth of, um, of feed. And um, that'll be specially engineered to have like a conveyor system that feeds directly into our gasification process, which I'm going to talk about right now. So um, I'm going to talk about gasification. Um, here's a, a CAD <coughs> diagram of uh, the gasifier. Um, up here, we see like here's our lock hopper. So after we get our um, feed conveyed into the lock hopper, we could have a controlled amount that feeds into a gasifier. And we're taking steam that's produced, um, that, that's from the process heat uh, made, made, by, uh, made by the hydrogen group. And basically, it pretty much blasts uh, the biomass into its components. And um, here we see a dual bed. Uh, it basically shoots up um, the components into cyclone separators. Cyclone separators are pretty much separator, uh, centrifuges for gases. And it feeds it into a combustor. Um, the char, like the charred material from there, uh, is able to heat up to around like 917 degrees Celsius, which provides enough heat to power the gasifier. So the gasifier is up to about 650 Celsius um, to sort of uh, preheat. We have to preheat air, but we don't have to pump it. Uh, what's really interesting about this uh, patented silver gas process is that we're able to operate at an uh, atmospheric temperature. and. Um, Another thing is just like it's commercially available. Um, it takes a lot of work off of our hands. And it, it's, it's much more reliable in terms of what it promises to give us. Um, so basically, because we have a lot of this heat, um, our sink gas is going to be pretty hot. And we're going to have to run it through a heat exchanger in order to get it to the proper uh, temperature for the next step in our process, which is acid gas removal. Um, uh, heat process explained. Uh, that's a work in progress. but. Uh, that, that heat exchanger is going to give about 19 megawatt uh, back to the uh, heat process. So um, 
the syn gas that comes out of here is mainly produced, consists of like hydrogen, uh, carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide, and, along with some other things right here. Um, here is a chart saying, uh, explaining um, the different flow rates. Uh, I ex already explained the 20, 24 kilograms per second of biomass. Uh, we're going to require about 2.6 kilograms per second from, uh, from the, of steam from the process unit and 11.9 kilograms per second of air that needs to be injected into the combustor. Um, so uh, when all said and done, we have about 20 kilograms per second of syngas coming out. Um, here's a pie chart basically saying uh, the composition of the syngas by volume. And we, kind of, we don't really want to, we don't want this right here, this carbon, carbon dioxide. We want to get it out of there because it's a, the poisons, the fish trough process that's going to come on later. And there's some other sulfides and uh, nitrogen space things that aren't really good for our future processes. So we're going to have to remove those. So now we go on to our acid gas removal process. Um, so I already mentioned uh, with our cyclones, we get rid of our uh, particulates um, and we get rid of it as ash and we just dispose of that. Um, that, uh, that operates at about 682 degrees Celsius. Um, we then put it through our heat exchanger and cool the syngas, send the extra excess heat to the heat process, and we then put it through water, water scrubber at 107 degrees Celsius. Um, in order for us to, to use these uh, processes right here, we had to run it through a compressor to get it from uh, atmospheric 0 0.1 megapascal up to 3.07 uh, 3 megapascal. And um, Lizzie, would you like to talk more about these yeah. low-cat and so, um, as Alex mentioned, the whole point of this process is that we want to get a syngas of mostly carbon monoxide and hydrogen that we can send onto the fissure trophs reactor and make gasoline and um, diesel from. So, these three processes are actually built into the silva gas process, which is they've been doing a lot of research on gasifiers. But what we're going to do is then take the output from silver gas and compress it so that we can remove the carbon dioxide and mostly the sulfur compounds because um, for gasoline and diesel to sell commercially you need less than 0.2 parts per million of sulfur which is very little and we don't want any carbon dioxide because that competes with carbon mon monoxide in the fischer tropsch reactor and will subtract from our yield. So the process we'll, we'll use is an amine acid gas removal and a low cat acid gas removal. This is sort of like a coarse filter that gets rid of the bulk of the CO2 and H2S. And then the low cat is a patented process that sort of is the finer filter to do it again and um, get rid of all the small parts. Uh, okay, I don't know how to go on. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, so from as, after the acid gas removal, you can see this will be the composition of our gas. We've gotten rid of the carbon dioxide, basically, without much loss in anything else. And you take a note at the um, ratio of CO to H2. Ideally, for Fischer tropes, we want something pretty even with the CO and H2. So you can see where we don't have a lot of hydrogen, which is why we need our hydrogen inputs from the hydrogen plant. So the fischer schroes reactor is where all the magic happens. You have carbon monoxide and hydrogen, and it bubbles in. And what it does is we bubble it in through a slurry of iron catalyst that's suspended in oil. And as it goes through, this reaction actually happens. So you have CH2 long carbon chains that form. They're mostly just um, one long chain, not many branches. But it's also an exothermic reaction that gives off some heat, which we'll have to remove, and gives off some water. Uh, there's a competing reaction that goes on at the same time. It's the water shift reaction that creates carbon dioxide and hydrogen. This is not ideal. But, um, so we've chosen an iron catalyst that will sort of minimize the water shift reaction that happens. And as you can see, so <coughs> we're going to generate about 22 megawatts of heat that will be removed. But um, the products that form are different lengths of carbon chains. So the carbon can go from 1 to 30 something, depending on many factors, one of them being the carbon monoxide to H2 ratio. 
our CO to H2 ratio is less than one, so it's actually going to be one of these lower curves here, um, or greater than one because we have more CO. So it's going to be one of these lower curves here where you can see we don't want the very high curves because these lower end products are light gases that just fly away. They're not really gasoline or diesel. Um, we, we will sell those as natural gas, but um, the gasoline and diesel curves are down here. And then the higher heavy waxes, we will have to refine to make them into sellable products. Sorry. So you can see as our process is designed right now, these are the outputs that will come out. It's mostly going to be gasoline and diesel. There will be some light gas to sell and some heavy wax to refine. This is actually without adding any hydrogen input before the fischer chose reactor. So, but that is something in the future we want to look into is adding some hydrogen before this reaction to sort of improve these products before even distilling and refining. But we will use do distillation and refining. The heat for this is going to come from the process heat system, and we will need hydrogen. Um, distillation, if you're not familiar with it, is basically just boiling everything you have. And as you send it up through a really tall tower, um, the Things with higher spoiling points, when they cool down, turn into liquid first, and they settle out on these trays. So you basically just, it just settles out for you. you have, it separates out your products into your heavy wax, the distillate gasoline, or diesel and gasolines. And then uh, these products can be sent on to refining. So the distillation and refining processes are pretty much the same as what they do right now in existing coal refineries. Um, and gasoline production. Um, you can see there's a lot of places where we need hydrogen. The hydrogen is needed to take the long carbon chains that are right now just one by one and you want to make it all single bonds first of all, saturate it so that you have just C to C, no double bonds. Um, you also want to create branches because that increases the energy density of your gasoline and diesel. So adding hydrogen helps with all of those. And you can see all these different processes. So in the end, we will have gasoline and diesel at these mass flows right now. So we can sell the light gas as a synthetic natural gas. And we'll also be able to sell diesel and gasoline. Um, our expected revenue, just based on the barrels per day and the current prices of oil, is about $1.7 million a day, assuming um, that an average car will take 15 gallons of um, gasoline. This amount of gasoline and diesel can fill about 18,500 cars a day. This isn't going to supply an entire city, but I think it's a good start. And obviously, there's still a huge demand. The U.S. 2011 demand is about 9.1 million barrels a day. So we're still a small part of the process, but um, I think it's a good start. And this is just one plant. So we're working to scale it up. Um, one minor thing to mention is that because we are trying to be a green process, there's a lot of carbon dioxide that gets removed during the process, unfortunately. Um, we're looking at different options of what to do with it. The, ideally, we would recycle it either back through our own process or maybe to the core because they use carbon dioxide, different things, or sell it. Um, but one other option that we're considering is because we are right next to the Gulf of Mexico, you can actually inject carbon dioxide deep into the ocean and that um, to such a level where it stays, uh, it just stays in the ocean and it doesn't come out as gas, basically. So it stays liquefied. And we're looking at some processes like that GE has made where you can do that. Um, so looking forward then, these, this is sort of a trend of gasoline prices in the last couple years. Um, so you can see that gas prices are definitely going up. The $1.7 million projected revenue is based on gas prices right now. As the gas prices continue to rise and as our dependence on foreign oil is still being worked out, I'm sure that the prices will rise more. Um, so for some conclusions about what's happening then, we have a start for a plant. There's, there were so many processes that go into making biofuels that we haven't been able to do many iterations, but there are def there's so many inputs and outputs that we definitely want to make more efficient. So 
some examples is the hydrogen production plant is creating oxygen. You can actually use oxygen to gasify in the gasification step in the very beginning, um, but that would involve using a different gasifier, so we haven't quite looked into that yet, but I think that would make our process a lot more efficient than having to do a twin bed. Um, we're also looking into different ways to recycle our wastes. And definitely we want to scale up this process a lot. Because as you saw, it's a start. It's, it's going to be a large plant, but um, there's the demand for oil and gasoline is so high today. And we think that this is feasible because the switchgrass numbers that you saw for prices and how much things are growing is also what's happening right now. Um, but there's so much research going into using switchgrass and to expanding the amount of switch sets that's grown in different areas that we think all of these numbers of how much biomass is available is also going to go up in the future, especially if we have plants that are using it, then as the demand for it goes up, more farmers will start growing switchgrass. So it's obviously going to be a very large scale production, producing a lot of jobs. And our total daily profit, if we subtract out what we think our cost will be, a very rough estimate, is over a million dollars a day. And you can compare this to the profit if we did not make biofuels, but simply um, sold the electricity from the core. Um, would be about $0.8 million a day. So you can see that with the biofuels production, it's almost double the amount that CORE can make on its own. So that concludes our section. Let's turn it over to Catherine. So this is a lot of information. I'm just going to summarize really briefly. Um, we were successful in um, producing green electricity, um, biodiesel, and biogasoline with our reactor. Um, our reactor um, hydrogen and um, our reactor coupled to hydrogen plant and um, biodiesel um, biofuels plant um, is going to give us minimal carbon emissions um, and it, it'll produce a um, <laughs> thousand megawatt electric of energy to the grid um, which is um, which is uh, ten times more than we were asked to produce initially um, and it'll also power our hydrogen and biofuels facilities. And um, hopefully, if um, our, press, our calculations are correct, we'll be able to provide enough um, biodiesel at the end of the day to fuel 18,500 cars. So um, we were successful in accomplishing all of our goals for this uh, design project. And we still, although we still have a lot of future work to do, because this was only a two month or three month um, project, um, we're happy to say that we were able to accomplish all of our goals. And we'll end with acknowledgments. Yeah. Um, so we really want to give some shout outs uh, to Dr. Short and Tyrell, first of all, for structuring the course in a great way and answering all of our designers' pesky questions. Um, the Process Heat Group would like to thank Karouche and Professor Golay, and actually Brian Herman as well for help. Um, Biofuels would like to uh, thank Professor Forsberg, and CORE would like to thank Professor Driscoll and Professor Tadrius. So with that, we want to thank you for your kind attention for the past hour and a half. And um, we would like to open the floor to any questions that any of you might have. Yes. If I scale it correctly, you need, I don't know, 10,000 of these plants to supply all U.S. gasoline. Is it something, do you have the number of thousands, anyway, I think. Yeah, it would be many thousands. Yeah. So. <laughs> So it's a big market for nuclear power, you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. And if they scale up the plant to produce more, then we would need less facilities as well. Yeah. To what extent do you consider economics and choosing your, and optimizing your process design and the amount of electricity you produce and biofuels? Um, so I can answer that overall for the project. Um, it was a factor in, def in definitely some processes just as far as feasibility is concerned, but it wasn't the main factor. It was, so it was, it was a design choice, but it was probably the last design choice that was considered as we wanted to make an optimal plant instead of a cheap plant. I, I've got a few questions on the reactor. At, at the top level, did you guys, uh, set the temperature requirements, the outlet temperature requirements you needed for the processes first, 
and then select the reactor type, or did you go the inverse? Uh, so basically what happened is early on in the process, we had a temperature, we were told that we kind of need a temperature requirement of roughly about 650 degrees C, or over 600. So we then chose our reactor given that temperature, and then as more design changes happened after we had already set our design, the t process heat temperature requirement went up. Um, so uh, we actually think that given the right materials, clad materials, you can actually push a lead reactor to up to 800 degrees C, which is a lot closer to the process heat requirements that they need, but that's more of a materials issue at this point. Um, and you meant the difference between lead and lead bismuth choice, because you were concerned a lot about not letting it freeze. Lead bismuth, did you reject lead itself? Yeah, so, yeah, so we had a, um, a choice between lead bismuth and lead. Um, we, we liked, uh, lead had like slightly better like uh, thermal properties. It also had a lower melting temperature. So like during like, we didn't mention it, but during startup, you have, like original startup, you have to get all your lead melted and all that kind of stuff. So like it did definitely help a lot. Okay, and then finally, what I didn't catch was the clad uh, selection and limit. Did you use the balancer short clad that they developed or did you go back uh, to what we had uh, originally? Because you mentioned this 2.5 meters per second limit, which uh, they have obviated and uh, that really restricts core design. So I, I didn't know what clad you really selected and why. Right now, our clad we're using is the uh, short Ballinger T91 with a protective layer on the outside. Uh, we, we are definitely looking to switch that to something else because right now, our core, our core lifetime is, or no, I should say our fuel lifetime, our reloading frequency is less than a light water reactor. We gotta take all our fuel out of there. So we're looking for something that can last like you know, five, seven years, something like that. Okay, but if you did that, then you don't have the two and a half meter per second limit on velocity that you set at the beginning. Uh, well, really, kind of the independent of whatever uh, material you use, beyond two and a half meters per second, uh, the, what we had found was that, like, the LBE just starts, like, ripping apart just about anything. It just, like, starts tearing away your, any any of your other like your heat exchangers any of that kind of stuff it's just going to start degrading it really quickly so that was more of like an independent of clad we needed to set this like flow limit there okay. independent of clad yeah because if you talk with him you know not two and a half it's five or six <laughs> exactly right yeah. okay thank you very much and uh, you guys are all very articulate. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Are there other questions? Start all the way on the right. So uh, just curious. Um, so this from uh, this reactor is from one of those reads. Um, how would you and y'all's family or friends think if uh, they were living next to a lead cooled nuclear reactor? <laughs> How's that sound? Uh, I mean, I would convince my family it was better. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I mean I would say, hey, listen, you know how hard it is to boil lead? Um, I mean, that was, yeah, that's one of the major concerns in a light water reactor is boiling all your coolant off and exposing your fuel. I'm like, you're gonna have a really difficult time doing that in our core. Also, the, um, the other reason we chose to site in Texas was because they are more pro-nuclear. They just you know, bought a whole bunch of plants and they're trying to develop that. So that, that was a, you know, in addition to the switchgrass, the temperature, the body of water, that was a thought that went into siting. Questions? I think you guys did a really great job of teaching me something about reactors in general, which is really helpful. Um, regarding the heat exchangers, though, um, my understanding was that you chose lithium carbide because uh, it was sort of like you were able to optimize the amount of energy that you extract by um, having it having the uh, temperature at which the phase change occurs be roughly the same as the temperature in inside your reactor. Right. Um, so are you able to also control the, the pressure and um, the other factors that might uh, you know, fluctuate the, the 
temperature transition, the, the phase change. The phase pressure of the lithium chloride? Yeah, like um, like if you're trying to optimize how much energy you get out, um, we are looking at those other factors in, in the, the phase change. So when we're looking at the phase change, uh, we just took the temperature into account. Um, but in terms of tweaking that actual melting point temperature, uh, in terms of calculating like the physical properties and doing the thermal analysis of this, I just kind of used lithium chloride, just the, the general properties. Um, but future work would probably include probably making a uh, eutectic or at least uh, adding a little bit of a salt to sort of, I guess, tweak that temperature to exactly where we need it to be. Um, 605 was just kind of used as the general number, but the margin off our melting, our operating temperature is pretty small. Um, okay. so, yeah. Yeah. If you look at capital costs, obviously you don't have a good estimate for your reactor design, but for the other components of your plant. Um, uh, for for uh, which group do you like, uh, for yeah. core group? For all of them? Or? <laughs> Uh, for core group, like uh, I can say that um, we did look at like capital costs of some of our components, um, and we think our like for instance our secondary cycle uh, we think is going to be uh, as I showed you those turbines are like a lot smaller, so there's there is a lot of benefit there. We think our our secondary cycle is cheaper. Also, we get that much higher efficiency out. So like given a light water reactor that you know produces you know say 1,200 megawatt electric and they're producing about 3,600 megawatt thermal because of their efficiency, we're actually producing more electricity, given the fact that because of our higher secondary, uh, because we're using a Brayton cycle at a higher operating temperature. Um, although I just, you know, very grandiose view. I think our reactor, we're gonna have expenses because the lead business the eutectic is expensive, and right now the uranium mononitride is expensive. But in general, our reactor is smaller because of the very high power density we have. So there's, you know, it's hard to say, put a number on it, but. We did look at it kind of in a grandiose view. Okay, so loosely speaking for the reactor, you're saying maybe less per thermal megawatt than a uh, light water reactor, but not really sure. What about the other parts? Because your proposal really is an overall plant, mm -hmm. many different components. The reactor is just one. So did you estimate the capital costs for the other parts of the plant? We did est estimate the capital costs for the heat exchangers. We contacted a company that manufactures alloy 617, but didn't hear back from them in time. So we used the heat tricks estimate for the steel, uh, the dollar per kilogram cost that they've quoted to estimate the cost of the heat exchangers, the printed circuit heat exchangers, which are fairly expensive. They're of the order of millions of dollars per heat exchanger. I don't remember the number of the top of my head, but I can get back to you on that. So what about the fisher trops reactor? Uh, we didn't look at specific capital costs because there were so many individual components that were sort of pulling from different current reports and putting together. But I do know that when we were choosing our design process in the beginning, we had a number of other processes besides Fisher tropes, such as with algae or with electrolysis kind of electrolytic cells kind of things that we were looking at. And of those different kind of facilities, the Fisher tropes seem to be the most uh, economic, just because it's very straightforward, like thermal dynamics. It's the one commercial part of the <laughs> process. <laughs> if, you yeah. buy a commercial, if you buy a picture growth plan, just send a check. It's <laughs> <laughs> that's all, quite literally. <laughs> yeah. And the hydrogen group, our best estimates right now is somewhere between 500 million and a million dollars for the plan. Yeah, it, overall, it's going to be, this design is probably more expensive than it would end up being given future work just because, as I said earlier, cost was very low on our design specification um, because this is an ideal facility. Um, so in future work, things will be optimized to decrease cost. Any other questions? So you're going to store the CO2 in the ocean. Uh, I don't know how good of an idea that uh, <laughs> is for PR. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's Texas though, so. <laughs> <laughs> it was an idea we're throwing out there because we had to explain what we're going to do with the CO2 right now. Um, and we haven't re really looked into how to recycle it into our process yet, so we couldn't include it in the recycling. But I think we are definitely the idealist to reuse it because
because there's still carbon in there. Okay, well, That's it. Thank you so much for coming. Like thank you all for coming.